What's up, Stellvase Warriors? Today, I'm super excited because I have Sarah Smith with me. Originally, she had me on her podcast, and I wanted to give back. She was super awesome, and I, I, like, I absolutely know she has a story and a, and a really awesome, powerful warrior story. So I have her on today. Sarah Smith, also known as Sarah Smith Strength from North Carolina. She's a former athletic coach, a personal trainer, level two Russian kettlebell instructor, postnatal fitness specialist. I mean, the list is pretty long. Uh, functional pelvic floor and gut health advocate with a master's in soil science and agriculture, which is really interesting. And lastly, according to your website, okay, I went oh, snooping no. on you. You like to watch people move, but not in a creepy way. <laughs> I had to add that in there because I started laughing when I saw that. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> I felt the need to clarify because I'm like, does that sound weird? Dude, that was so funny. I was just like reading through all your stuff. I'm like, this girl's hilarious. And uh, by the way, I love your boom box picture. I think that uh, if no one can forget you with that picture, the one with the boom box, like I love it. Just, I, I just had to put that on the table before we get got Yeah. There. Oh, my gosh. I love that series of photos. My friend is my photographer, and she gets me. And I am 90s kid. Like, I was born in 1980. So I was, like, preteen teenager in the 90s. And I, like, there's not a 90s song that I don't know. And there's a good <laughs> okay. chance I know all the lyrics. <laughs> like, Okay. Um, Favorite yeah. 90s song. Go. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So it's got to be Bop Gun by Ice Cube. Okay. Oh my Favorite. God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. George Clinton. And that, there's a version with like George Clinton and Parliament Funk is on it. Oh, it's so good. The oh. message is, is terrible, but the song <laughs> is good. That, that's always the case, right? Yeah. Right on. Okay. So I have you here today because I mean, I want to know more about you. I mean, we went into it a little bit on your podcast and that's part of the reason why I have you on here. So let's talk about like, what got you started in fitness? Obviously, Let's go a little farther back and just what got you to where you're at now? Yeah. Um, so I was like an athletic kid. I moved. I was tr track and field captain, all that jazz. I liked movement. Um, I picked up, I became a smoker in late high school, college. And so I abandoned all movement and exercise and I felt like rubbish. And so I actually used running and exercise to help me kick that. And it took me a few years to do that. Um, and then in my early 20s, I went back to athletics because I was like, you know, I get this. I like this. I put a lot of time in. I started running track when I was like 10. So I knew a lot about running. Yeah, so I became an athletic coach for an all-girls high school team. And I did that for a few years. And it was one of my favorite jobs. But if anyone knows anything about high school coaching, there is no money in it. <laughs> so, oh, no. Uh, yeah. I was also a high school science teacher at the time. So, so that was cool, but still like, you know, just yeah. getting by pretty much. Um, and so I went to, I basically went and I worked at the National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Health. My background is in biology. I studied biology. And so I worked in science for, I want to say 10 straight years, almost 15 years. And I did everything from like cancer research to environmental microbiology to landing and ending up in agriculture and soil science. And the, the, the reason for that was that like, first I wanted to be a doctor. And then I was like, well, wait a minute, people's health is really dictated by their environment and right. microbes. So then I went into the environmental microbiology world and I was doing a lot of research in that. And then I was like, well, even more so than that, it seems like food, food is a big thing. So then I'm like, but how we, how we grow food and how we make food, which is also environmental microbiology, if you understand like soil stuff, um, is so impactful for health. And so, so I landed and ended up getting a master's degree in soil science and agriculture. And I love it. I love science. I love health. I love the body. It's just fascinating to me. Like I read science books for fun. Like that's just interesting to me. You know? I, I absolutely feel like I'm talking to an astronaut right now. I'm like listening to you. I'm like, wow. I'm just like nodding my head like shit. This is going to be a good podcast. <laughs> the funny thing about it is that like, you know, I actually really struggled to even like understand science. And it was not like I was never like a math engineering science type kid. Like I think people come out like that. But because I love the concept of healing and health and medicine, mm. I figured out like, 
I need to learn how this stuff works or I'm going to be of no help to anyone. And so I like, I got C's in chemistry when I was in um, college and I thought I was like going to fail out and I was not doing well. And then I basically sort of figured out how to reframe science and come at it more from this like passionate curiosity and less like there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. And I also kind of, you know, divorced myself of the belief that I couldn't be good at it, you know, like it, right. it wasn't coming easy to me, but that didn't mean that I couldn't do it. So, so I like talking about science because I feel like I'm like, I'm looking at it from the outside. I'm not like some brainiac, but yeah, I kind yeah. of figured out how to speak the language to a certain extent. Right. So, so yeah, so I got my master's degree in soil and agriculture, which is really fun. I love growing food. I love understanding the soil. What's happening in the soil is so directly related to public health, gut health. And everything because like everything that's in the dirt ends up in our food and everything right. that's in the food ends up in our body you know so it's a real mm -hmm. logical connection but i have i i had two kids in grad school and then i got pregnant again <laughs> because, okay like, i need to get a hobby apparently <laughs> <laughs> um, and i was just like i can't work full-time like if you work full-time in agriculture like you're in the field you know All right farm super demanding job. And if you're doing research and everything, and I had three little boys that I felt like I really needed to be engaged and present for. So I said, okay, I'm going to take a step back from science, but what else am I going to do? I'm like, oh, I loved coaching. Okay. Can I, in my thirties, get back to coaching? Is that like a thing? And sure enough, there's this beautiful thing called the internet where you <laughs> can start online fitness businesses. And, or if you want to work in person, I was doing both. Um, and and start coaching and teaching people um, how to lift and train. And so I had like that athletic background, but I had gotten into weight training and strength training as I was a mom, because when you're a mom, everything has to be super efficient because you don't have a lot of time. And I just saw that lifting weights and resistance training was changing my body. And I, so after a few years of that, I was leaving science and I'm like, I'm going to try and coach other people how to do what I'm doing. Right. And that was in 2015. And now we're in 2020. So yeah, right. that was five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Now when did, okay. Cause obviously let's talk a little bit about the pelvic uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. So pelvic organ prolapse and then the pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, you have a story behind that. So tell me kind of what happened there and, and how everything kind of came into place for all of your like fitness stuff. Cause I see that you're like niching down to that. And obviously there's a reason for that. Tell me about it. Yeah. So, so here I was like making this huge career shift, mindset shift. I'm like, I'm not going to be Sarah, the agricultural soil scientist. I'm going to be Sarah, the coach. So I'm like, I start my business. I'm pumped. I have my first coaching club. You know, when you start your business and people sign up, you're like, oh my gosh, people, like, think, people want to pay yeah, me yeah, yeah. <laughs> to teach them how to do stuff. And I had this amazing coaching club of like 20 women that I was teaching how to lift weights. They were getting great results and all this stuff. And about nine months into that, I started to have symptoms of like real like heaviness and pressure in the vaginal canal. And I was like, Oh, no, yeah. what is that all about? And this was like, you know, nine months after my, my son was born. So it wasn't like right after I think a lot of times okay. people think like, you know, pelvic floor issues are a mom problem. And pregnancy and birth can be the straw that broke the camel's back, but plenty of people I work with have pelvic floor issues unrelated to that. So this was like a little bit after, afterwards, and I literally couldn't do anything. I was, I was finding that even like walking was making me symptomatic. And for anyone here that's listening, doesn't know what pelvic organ prolapses, which it turns out I had, it basically like you have pelvic organs, you have your bladder, your uterus and your rectum. And if they shift out of place and if the ligaments that hold them in place are stretched beyond like their integrity, then the organs move. And so that feels like downward pressure, kind of like you're sitting on a ball and some people experience incontinence and there's a lot of different symptoms for that. And it can happen to men, women, and it's not something exclusively that happens to um, women, but it's far more common in like the postpartum population. So so I, it took me a while to face the music, you know, when you kind of know there's something wrong and you're like, I don't actually want to know, I don't want to face it. But eventually I yeah. got myself to a pelvic floor PT and she examined me and she's like, yeah, you have grade two cystocele, which means my bladder had moved. And they're like, don't just, you know, don't lift anything. Don't walk downhill. 
And they're like, maybe with lots and lots of training, you'll be able to lift a 10 pound kettlebell. And I was like, and what? this is, this is when you were actually lifting and having your, your 20 girls or was this before? Yes. No, this was in the middle of that. Oh, so I'm my training goodness. them. And you know, and I, the thing was, is like online, uh, the videos were all pre-made and everything. So I wasn't having to work out, but I was still trying to work around it. I'm like, well, I got to do some stuff, you know? And I, and then I was concerned. I'm like, I don't want to be a fraud. I don't want to be telling them to do things that I can't do. And here I am having all these symptoms. And I had never even heard of the pelvic floor before mm -hmm. this. Like I had three kids. I had all home births, unmedicated. Like I was in it. I was, I was one of those people that was like, <laughs> game on. Like I want all of it. And I, and I didn't know what the pelvic floor was. So when yeah. I went to the pelvic floor PT and she's like saying all this stuff, I'm like, why didn't anybody tell me about this? You know, I was an athlete. I'm having all these babies. Like surely I should have known about it. And the, unfortunately, the, the messaging around it was basically like, you can't do anything. And she was like showing me how to do like bird dogs with a resistance band. And I'm like, yeah, this is I got it. <laughs> You're like, no. Yeah, it was really bad. So, so basically, I had a period of mourning or sitting on the bench doing nothing because even just walking and moving um, was just causing symptoms. And I just felt really bad for myself. And I tried this particular therapist for a little while and I wasn't really getting a lot of results because what a lot of pelvic floor PTs tell men and women to do is Kegel and Kegel is just a pelvic floor contraction where you have to lift the pelvic floor and you have to kind of squeeze it and mm -hmm. you know and the, the pelvic floor is the foundation of your core and so it, it's not a bad exercise in the in the fact that everybody should know how to access their pelvic floor to recruit it and then also relax it but in my case it was like I already it's a, it's a whole thing, but basically I already was recruiting. I was already over recruited, you know? So it's like, if you think about flexing your bicep, then I was trying to flex it more, but it was already flexed, you know? So what I really needed is to learn how to totally relax it so that I could totally recruit it, you know? Um, now, how so, did you find that out though? Yeah. So after a period of just like feeling bad for myself in mourning and I tried the PT and I wasn't getting any good results, I quit PT temporarily and I don't recommend that for people. I do recommend that you find someone else to work with, but that was just what, that was just my journey. And I felt bad for myself again. Like I said, I was just like distraught and trying to like have a safe face and coach my clients and be like, yeah, okay, good. But not really couldn't do anything myself. And so after about three months of just kind of mourning and not knowing what to do and just kind of gently move, I was like, okay, forget this. Like I'm, my body is smart. Yeah, this happens. People get injured, but like, I haven't done everything in my power to try to figure out a how the pelvic floor works and b how to strengthen every single thing around it to support it if it is now weak you know if it is messed up and yeah. the reality of it is when you push out babies like yeah you do have some trauma sometimes like you know tissues tear and you have scar tissue and it's just living life you get surgery you're gonna have scar tissue like our bodies have history to them right and we can't erase right. that but I think if we have hope and we appreciate the body and we believe in our own strength and believe that there's a design to it, I think we can come up with ways to work with it. So I was actually like one night late at night on a forum feeling like looking at me like, there's no answers out there. Cause you know, everyone yeah. takes like WebMD or Google yeah. and pelvic organ prolapse exercise and seeing what people are doing and everything is basically like surgery and you can't do anything and don't lift anything. And I'm like, I love lifting. I love strength training. Like, it made me feel strong. It made me feel capable. I don't want to give it up, you know? Um, and I found this forum and there was this woman, I don't know what her name was or anything. I wish I knew it was, it was like CrossFit 6789 was her handle in some forum. Or <laughs> Top of that CrossFit. I like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and she's like, oh yeah, I have pelvic organ prolapse. I just, um, she said she put these like sea sponges in her a vagina and she's like and I just go and I work out because it gives me support and I was like wait a minute you're going to CrossFit they're telling me I can't wow. do anything and here this girl's doing CrossFit workouts so um that gave me a lot of hope because I thought there's a way there's a way around this there's a way through so then I just buried myself in anything I could find about the pelvis learning about pelvic floor anatomy but because I had studied agriculture from what's called like a systems thinking approach where it's like everything is connected. Everything is related. We can't just look at one piece. We have to look at how it, it, everything works within the context of the larger system. I didn't just study the pelvic floor, but I studied everything it was connected to mm. and understood that 
the pelvic floor is told what to do by the nervous system and by your breath, by our breathing habits. And the diaphragm is actually, the pelvic floor is important, but the, the diaphragm is king. The diaphragm ah. calls the shots. Yeah. So, so I just learned a lot about breathing and the importance of alignment. And I, I just got to understand my body better. And I took what I was learning and I, I started trying it in the gym. So I would like, I learned how to manage pressure better because a lot of people like we don't breathe. We're like, like <laughs> shortness of breath, like fight or flight. We don't even understand how to manage pressure. We don't understand that like our core is a pressure management system. So many people think of it in terms of like six pack abs, you know, and, right. and I started to see how like when I, br I would breathe in, if I could be pushing down on my pelvic floor. And so when I would exhale to do certain movements, when you exhale, the pelvic floor recruits and your core comes in. And so I started playing with different kinds of pressure and different movements. And I used like the kettlebell deadlift was one of my favorite movements because I had all these different kettlebells. You could try things at different weights. Okay. And that was when I began to see how like, how I could access my pelvic floor to support me in movement to give me a little bit better stability. And, you know, I could go on and on. Um, so we can unpack anything. <laughs> But, but basically, once I started to figure it out, like I did not, I cannot stand when like influencers and people online are like, I have the solution because I, I, you know, I'm in it, in the middle of it. And yeah. I, I waited until I really felt like I had a handle on how to work with pelvic floor stuff to even start talking about it right. publicly in a coaching setting. I did start to tell people, I'm like, start paying attention to this because as soon as it was on my radar, I'm like, Oh, I want all my coaching women to learn, uh, you know, about it. But I really waited. Um, it took me about, I'd say a year and a half of working with pelvic floor stuff and understanding it and exercises to, to find techniques and strategies that work to help women to get back to movement, even when they have pelvic floor issues. Yeah. And I'm assuming that everyone's different, right? So, I mean, yeah. if someone came to you, someone could be completely different than another client, right? So I can see how you're saying, like, if there's influencers out there, it's like, it's not a one fits all. No, like I everything mean, everything else. Oh my gosh. It's like, this worked for me. So it's going to work for you. It's like, no, not necessarily. And, you know, it's like any kind of muscle. If you don't understand what the root problem is, then any of your recommendations can actually make things worse, right? So if like, if somebody um, is struggling with like mobility and you start giving them all these exercises for stability or something, it's not necessarily going to solve the problem. And with the pelvic floor, that's a huge problem because people, a lot of people, men and women leak they leak urine, they leak feces and exercise. And they're not talking about it because who wants to talk about that, right? right. Um, <laughs> and for a lot of people, it's because they have over-recruited pelvic floor. So if you think about your core as a column or a canister, that floor, the bottom, which isn't really a floor, it's more like a supple trampoline or hammock that's supposed to be responsive to movement. It's supposed to move down when you inhale and lift up when you exhale. And so in fitness, a lot of times, if we want to do a heavy lift, right, we, we inhale and we, we fill our canister with pressure. We brace up against a belt, right? right? And then we exhale hard to get the, you know, the huge barbell with all the plates up off the ground. And so we're using that system. But for a lot of people, like they're doing that, but if they are not actually neurologically able to access the pelvic floor and it's just over recruited and it's lifted all the time, when you fill your cavity with air, you're pushing down on muscles that should relax, but they don't relax because we don't know how to do that. We haven't, and a lot of it is because you might breathe really great in the gym, but do you breathe really great like the other hours of the day, you know? So right. that sort of thing. So... <clears throat> A lot of men and women, and then like a lot of emphasis in athletics is about having a really, really tight, recruited, strong core, i.e. six-pack abs, and having a lot of tension in the core. But there isn't always a lot of emphasis on also relaxing that tension and, and, and using your breath because having six-pack abs is basically taking a house. If, if you don't have a good reflexive core stability system in the middle, meaning like your diaphragm and your pelvic floor work well to manage pressure, you're basically putting like vinyl siding on a house with like decrepit walls that are falling apart. It doesn't matter if you have six pack abs and you look strong right. if the center column of your body isn't strong. So, so yeah, so a lot of people have over recruitment issues where their pelvic floor can't relax and they can't relax their belly and, and they can't manage pressure. And so the pressure comes out in terms of like um, hernias, 
So like a lot uh -oh. of people get like inguinal hernias or um, umbilical hernias because the pressure has nowhere to go. The pressure needed to go down because the pelvic floor needed to relax and the, the belly needed to relax outward. But if it doesn't, it'll find a way. So you spring a leak or you actually leak like, um, you know, urine and men, a lot of times they, Julie Weeb, who's a famous PT, she talks about sharding. So men, a lot of times, like they do, like they can't manage wow. the pressure and it comes out the rectum, you know, and with yeah. other stuff. Right. So, yeah. so yeah, this stuff is actually pretty common. And so what's appropriate for them is going to be different for somebody that has a weak pelvic floor that they can't access or someone that has pelvic organ prolapse who might need a little bit better support. And then you can actually have a mix of all the things. So yes, it's highly individualized. Is the <laughs> right <up. laughs> now? Is there a statistic on that? Like, do you know statistic on like how like how how common this really is? Because like I honestly like I'm talking to you about it, mm -hmm. and I've I've heard of it, but I've never heard of it in this way. So it's new to me as yeah. well. Well, you know, I don't, I don't even say statistics anymore because some of so many of them are inflated. Like you'll find some mm. statistics that say like. When examined in certain studies, up to 50% of women that have had babies have pelvic organ prolapse, clinical pelvic organ prolapse, whether they have symptoms or not. And then like in the incontinence is like, I don't know, I think it's like 30% of women worldwide experience incontinence. And then men, it's like, there isn't a lot of research about mm -hmm. it. Um, okay. And this is the kind of, the problem with this is it's not something that a lot of people are talking to, but more and more awareness and better research is being done. And that's the other problem. There just hasn't been a ton of funding and a lot of research in this area, um, particularly as it relates to athletics, you know, like right. one of the things about the pelvic floor, I think is a lot of times people think it's a woman's health issue. And so that's kind of stifled research and conversations because no, it's not. We're talking about like muscles. Like this is a complex, I mean, I know you, the podcasters can't see, but, but Victoria, you can see like- this Yeah, yeah a crazy complex network of muscles in multiple layers that give stability to the pelvis and stability to the torso. Like things can go wrong with them in the same way that like things can go wrong with your glutes or things can go wrong with your, the muscles in your shoulder and your back, you know? So right. it's like, this is a performance and athletic issue. Um, and I think the, we're changing that. We're seeing more conversations and there are even more and more public floor PTs that work with men. Um, and people like myself, we just try and talk about it as much as possible because things like erectile dysfunction, prostate titis, um, urge to go to the bathroom, performance issues in sex, um, low back pain, tailbone pain, constipation, like these are things that are problematic in the male population that have over recruitment, muscle spasms, like weird spasms that they can't control. And I've talked to a wow. number of men that are like, oh yeah, I have that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's yeah. incredible. See, I, I love that you brought that up because I was thinking, I was thinking just women. Yeah. Right. And women who had babies. That's all mm -hmm. I was thinking when, yeah. when I saw pelvic, I was like, wow, right now when you're explaining that, I had yeah. no idea that men could also have issues. Yeah, and it's it's definitely more prominent for females because for well for one thing like women that have had babies or women in general we have that extra opening like the vaginal right. canal so there's things we're just a little bit more vulnerable in that in that if we can't manage pressure well things can fall into that they can prolapse against the canal and there are power lifters and crossfitters that get prolapsed Olympic weightlifters men and women that get prolapsed just because they push too hard but especially women and then the other thing is with a lot of women I see is that you know, the pelvic floor is a hammock at the base. It, it runs transverse. So you have the pelvic floor, pelvic diaphragm, the thoracic diaphragm, and then you even have a cervical diaphragm and actually a cranial diaphragm. So you have like a bunch of, wow. yeah, it's pretty wild. <laughs> and they all move together when you breathe. It's really, really cool. Ooh. And what I find, and like really cool people that really understand the body, like osteopaths and a lot of people that do body work and are in tune to the energy aspect of movement and life, find that women especially deal with the pelvic floor issues. It's a hammock at the bottom and it's the catch-all. A lot of women process grief and um, pain and difficulty in the, in the pelvis. Um, and it's just kind of like, if you don't, if you have unprocessed issues, then a lot of times I think it, it all falls in the bottom and the hammock wow. that is the pelvic floor catches it, you know? And so so I just deal with a lot of women that like there's an, an emotional component, there's a lifestyle component, there's a stress component. And when they start to make changes in some of um, like how they deal with stress and how much they expect of their body and, um, you know, 
decrease inflammation and whatever that helps to improve, you know, but the mechanic piece and the, the actual biomechanics and the, um, and the breathing piece are a huge part of it too. But yeah, anyone can have it for sure because wow. they're just muscles, you know? I feel like if someone watches this, uh, this podcast, like the, on YouTube, my mouth is going to be open like half of the time while you're talking. Cause I'm like, yeah. really? Yeah. I'm like, Oh shit. Yeah. But yeah. now, okay. So you have actual, you have an actual like online course on this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I have two courses. I have a free course, um, that has two names. Isn't that ridiculous? I couldn't <laughs> pick one name. So I first I named it breathe like a badass because I think yeah. when people think of breathing, they're like, Oh, meditation, calming, chill. Yes. And a lot of people that are into fitness, they want to do cool things. They want to swing the mace. They want to do heavy <laughs> barbell lifts. They want to, they want to snatch kettlebells. They're like, breathing is for wimps, you know? Right. And, and they don't want to put the time. They're like, oh, yeah, I breathe. I'm just like, yeah, sure you do. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like that. So I can say, like, I was the kind of person for a long time that's like, I don't care about this stuff. Like, it's not that important. Um, yeah. But what I've seen is harnessing the power of the breath is so impactful because if you can start to really move your diaphragm, which is that muscle like here, it, right, right where your rib cage is, mm -hmm. and it's connected to the spine, it's connected to the sternum. If you can move it with every breath as well as you can and get used to it moving through its full range of motion, then it, can, it starts to communicate better with the pelvic floor and then you have pressure management all day long every day. That is where our strength comes from. The, the, the max tension recruitment that we need to do for that, anything above like, you know, 80% of our max, that's just gravy. But if, like I said before, if the core isn't working really well, you're not strong. And just by breathing with a diaphragm, we can tap into the vagus nerve and we can calm our whole body. We can literally mm -hmm. change our mood and change our perspective. Digestion improves because we get out of this fight or flight. Our, biochemically, we change as in we become less acidic there when you're tense and you're stressed and you're fight or flight, you just have more hydrogen ions in you and you're more twitchy. So mm. pain will be worse. Your muscle movement will be like jerkier and things like that. So breathing alone helps to calm the body and strengthen the body and that we get, we, we become more powerful by tapping into that system. And we also become better students. It's easier for us to learn because we're neurologically in a better learning state. So I made this free digital course called breathe like a badass. Cause I wanted people to know like, yeah, it's kind of like, it's like, you know, you, if you study martial arts and you study real masters of movement, I feel like steel mace is like this too. Mm -hmm. Getting into the flow, into the Zen state and to really understand what you're doing and to not white knuckle it and overpower it. That's where all the strength and the power is. And so right. breathing is a big part of that. So, um, so better, but breathe like a badass was doing okay. But then I named the title better than Kegels. I, I used that <laughs> and that like blew up. Now I have like, work. yeah, I have tons of people, like over a thousand people in the course now. Wow. Of, um, everyone like, so it's eight free modules just of breathing. And then Perfect. if people take that, yeah, and they like that, then they can take connect your core and pelvic floor and connect your core and pelvic floor. Basically it reiterates the breathing, but then it starts to talk about alignment and alignment is so important with mace, you know? Yeah. Making sure that your movement mechanics are neutral because the skeleton needs to be stacked. Like your head is heavy. And if it's not stacked over the spine and if you have rounded shoulders, you can't access your diaphragm. So you can't breathe, which means you can't access the pelvic floor and you can't even like recruit your glutes in a balanced way. You can't recruit your core. So alignment is really important. Then we get into like primal movements because I believe primal movements are how you, how you retrain that. Yeah. Cause yeah. like, they're all the things we did as a baby to first learn how to be strong. So rolling and rocking and crawling and all that jazz is how we learned it the first time. So I use the original strength training system and then some other primal movements that I like to retrain that. And then we get into strength training. So it's really like, it's, a, it's pretty comprehensive. Yeah. See, I didn't know that, that, that primal stuff sounds really interesting. Can, can you give me an example of like, like an exercise or something? Yeah. Just so, one, like, like give us a little hint in case someone wants to like go all in with this. Yeah. So rocking on all fours is one of my favorite movements and you can rock into crawling and rocking is really cool because what you did as a baby was first you started lifting your head up 
and then you moved your head around and then you flipped over and you rolled. And anyone that's ever seen a baby or has a baby has seen them do that. Like, oh my gosh, they rolled over. <laughs> and the head is so strong and the head is actually how you build core strength. And then they, they get onto all fours as they prepare to be able to crawl. And before they go, they kind of rock their hips back and forth. Like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, right? And that is actually where you started, where you learn posture. Um, and that's because the, this is like whole body joint integration. We talk about this a lot in the original strength training system. And it's like literally your wrists, your ankles, your knees, your hips, your shoulders, and your neck are all moving at the same time when you rock. So you're learning where your body is in space, you know, and it's proprioception. It's taking information in from your environment and teaching your nervous system to respond accordingly. So it's a great way to retrain alignment. If you don't have great posture and you're always like, sit up straight, sit up straight, fix my pelvic tilt all the time, rocking multiple times a day. It's not the only thing that you should do, but it's really helpful, especially if you breathe with the diaphragm while you're doing it, because you're retraining your body what neutral looks like and how everyone needs to work together to move you. Because a lot of people that get into core and pelvic floor or any injury issues, it's because somebody's on the bench with respect to a muscle or ligaments and someone else is overworking, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we're trying to like redistribute the work and be like, everyone has right. their division of labor, like stop doing other people's job. And hey, you lazy muscle, get your <laughs> ass in gear, you know? So, so rocking is great for that. And then if you want to crawl, then rock a little bit, just like a baby would, and then go crawl. You know, it's funny you're mentioning this and I'm like, I'm all for it. Like, I'm like, I'm about to go to the park and rock my ass. But like, you know, there's going to be people out there that kind of hear that. They're like, eh, that's a little crazy. It's something yeah. that I probably wouldn't do. But so I give you and like all the ladies and, and men that signed up for your stuff, like props for sure, because I know that's yeah. something that everyone's oh, yeah. willing to do, right? Oh, I get some weird looks. The, it's funny because when you get good at crawling, then you take your knees up and you're leopard crawling. So you're crawling with your knees up. And I, I take my kids to the playground. Like, that's what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> like, okay. Um, but I don't care because it feels so good. Yeah. And it's really, oh, my gosh, you want to get strong fast, crawl with your knees up. It's like cardiovascular. It's amazing for your hips. It's major core work. It's great for the shoulders. Your quads will be on fire. It's, it's, and it's an insane workout. And I'm just at this point in my life, I turned 40 this year. I'm like, I don't really care. People Dude, you don't, you don't even look 40. Oh okay. my God. Like, I'm serious. That's crazy to me. Yeah, it went by. It's a blur. So. <laughs> but yeah, and my great. kids. Thank you. And my kids don't care either. My kids don't think anything of it. They think it's Shoot. normal. They're Hell people. yeah. And I'm glad you're teaching them that because when they grow up, they are. They're good. They're, it's just going to be so normal to them and they're going to be great just body wise. Let, so let's talk about the gut. Let's go. Let's move on to the gut. Let's talk about that. Like, obviously you talked a little bit how that had to do with the, like, the agriculture part. Now, uh, you know, go for it. Yeah. Well, I love the gut for so many reasons. But one of the things that I think is really interesting is when you think about your body, there is a mucus line, mucus and microbe lined highway that goes from your mouth to your anus. And this is the only, except with the exception of your nose, this is the only real super safe way for us to take in things from our outer environment. That's how our food and our water gets in our body. Because the rest of the body has to have a very consistent environment. The pH has to stay the same. The osmolarity, which basically means how much um, particles are dissolved in the blood or in the fluid has to be the same. The temperature has to be the same. We don't want toxins in there or anything. So we have this cool system where it's totally acceptable for us to take in stuff that has, you know, bacteria, parasites, viruses, other things, contaminants in it, into our body, as long as it stays in this highway. And, and the way that that highway stays maintained and safe is that it's lined with mucus and bacteria live on and feed on the mucus and they maintain the highway. They make sure that there's no holes and they patch it up. But in modern life, what's happened to like, we are super sanitary. And so we bleach and clean everything. We don't eat food that's locally grown in the dirt around us anymore. We eat a lot of food that has antibiotics in it. Even our water has antibiotics. And so over time, a lot of people are losing all the bacteria that live along that highway. So like, you know, you have, you have bacteria in your mouth, you have bacteria in your intestines. We've even seen that there are some bacteria that are designed to live in the stomach. And that's a pH of two, which is really acidic. 
So that's crazy. You have some bacteria in the small intestine, large intestine, and their job is to take all the food that you eat, um, help you to break it down, make all the chemicals you need. There's things that you need in your body that you can't make, like serotonin. Everyone knows like serotonin makes you feel good. And people that have to take like, what are the SSRIs if they're like, they're depressed and have anxiety, that's boosting their serotonin level. But 80 or 90% of the serotonin in your body is made in your gut by your bacteria. And so we're losing them because we're killing them both with things in our environment. And then we're also, um, you know, we're just eating diets now that don't promote their growth. The bacteria that live in the body, they live on fiber. So they want us to eat like lots of vegetables and because that's what they do. They break it down and they ferment and they, and that's how they live. And so mm. as we've been losing them and kind of killing them off and we can kill them off with stress too. Um, the integrity of the highway starts to get degraded and we're seeing so much chronic disease can be traced back to the gut because we're getting holes. We're eroding holes in the mucosal lining and we're losing the bacteria, which are the gatekeepers whose job were to make sure that things that came into the body from the outside world didn't get into the bloodstream. And so when it gets into the bloodstream, then the immune system attacks it. And so you have autoimmunity, people just really sick, their immune systems are down and they're tired. Um, you have chronic inflammation and everything. So, so the gut is really fascinating to me because you can be working hard in the gym. You can be doing all sorts of stuff. But if your gut microbiome is imbalanced and you can't extract nutrition from your food and you have toxins and um, food particles getting into your blood, then you're going to be tired. You're going to have chronic disease issues. You're going to have inflammation. You're not going to be getting as good results as you could be because how can your body be making muscle and doing all the stuff it needs to, if it can't extract nutrition from the food and it's multitasking because it's like trying to, you know, keep you healthy and keep you okay because the gut bugs aren't doing their job. So I love probiotics. I love eating food that's like locally made with like naturally occurring stuff. So like kimchi and like fermented right. vegetables and all that stuff, because those are your soil microbes that they live in your gut. We evolved with them. And even geographically, like, you know, everyone has different kinds of microbes around them that convert for the health benefits that you need that are different in Yuma than they are in Raleigh, North Carolina, and stuff like that. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, so living close to the soil and being in the dirt and spending time outside is a really great way to help to boost your gut microbiome and help to keep that highway maintained because when stuff gets out of the highway, that's when the immune system starts having to work really hard and it's draining. And then, you know, your lymphatic system is working a lot too. And a lot of people have issues with like lymph drainage. Um, Dr. Perry Nicholson of Stop Chasing Pain, he has an entire business just helping people deal with lymph. Wow. And lymph is like, you know, it's, it's important for removing toxins from the body too. And just a lot of people's bodies are working really hard these days because there's just toxins in our food and in our environment. So, so I love the gut because yeah, yeah, taking yeah. care of your gut is going to help you to break down food, get the nutrition that you need and get the feel good chemicals that you need too, like dopamine and serotonin and like even like vitamin K is made by E. coli that live in the gut. There's a lot of vitamin B12 you need your gut bacteria for that. So there's a lot of stuff that we can't do on our own without these guys. Yeah. Now I'm seeing like, no, I don't know, but I'm, now I'm seeing like this link between maybe mental health and oh. these invisible illnesses that are going on right now. Yep. And, and actually like the gut, I'm like the whole time when you were talking about that, I like, that's all I could think about. I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh yeah. Like there have been numerous studies to link like anxiety, depression, ADD, ADHD, Autism, there's studies to show that kids that have autism have a, um, an imbalance, gut microbiome, diabetes, dementia. And it, it's, it's wow. funny because, yeah, it's really interesting. A lot of these people, too, have um, heavy metal toxicity as well, like a lot of heavy metals. And, um, and heavy metals in the body disrupts your gut microbiome, too, because there are certain kinds of bacteria that have to grow in larger population to sequester the metals so that they don't harm you. So like a lot of people that have like high levels of candida, if you hear about like candida, right. a lot of the candida diet, it's been found in some studies that candida is actually protective against heavy metal poisoning. So people will have candida issues and, and all that stuff. 
And, but it isn't necessarily that the yeast was the problem if they got exposed to a lot of heavy metals. The yeast is an evolutionary protective mechanism to help them. That's, that's one of the different theories. So, but yeah, the, the mental health piece, most chronic disease that you're seeing now, any autoimmune disease, any like heart disease, diabetes, mental health stuff, there is numerous. That's studies. insane, right? Yeah. Like how the yeah. gut is related to all of that. And I'm, you know, when you mentioned candida right now, um, I had a family member where the candida literally almost came out of her skin, like on her arms. Oh, yeah. And I was yeah. like, mm-hmm. wow, I had never seen that. So that's interesting to know about the metals, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. yeah. Too. Yeah, there's a, there's some like cool detox sprays that they now make called um, made with a zeolite, which is a mineral that binds toxins in the body. A lot of people are having good success with that. Um, so but yeah, I, I've known num- numerous people that have had candida so bad that they got serious rashes, but it, it comes from the gut. So, wow. Wow. Yeah. Man, I, I feel like I, I should sell this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just get sent you all the fun. No, I'm serious. Like, this is like really, I, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, you gave us yeah. so, so much information. So yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your online courses and like, so if someone was looking for you, uh, like they're listening and they're looking for you online, um, let's talk about your online courses. I know you have kettlebells for cool kids. Uh, you, obviously we talked about the connector floor and pelvic floor, and then you have the breath course, which is free, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk a little about that kettlebell one because yeah. that one's really interesting and I'm not gonna, I am not leaving this podcast until we talk about that. I mean, you're a level two Russian kettlebell instructor. So I'm like, let's do it. Let's talk about a little bit about that. Yeah, so I um, I love that course. It's it's there's two levels to it. Level one is basically for a beginner that barely knows anything about kettlebells, and it takes you, it teaches you everything you need to know, and in the end, basically, you have a really good grip on the swing and all hinge based movements. Mm. So um, and it's all set to '90s hip hop music so, yeah so you get playlists to work out with um they're oh. on they're on spotify so i made all these playlists um that was, is so creative like how did you even come up with that just the love of the 90s music yeah well i was showing up on it this was back when instagram like let you play music and they didn't like censor you and and, oh. and take your videos down so back in the day like when i first got into weight training i would go into my basement and i would turn up my favorite 90 songs and I would work out to them and so I was doing that a lot and I was showing up online and people like kind of knew me for that okay. and so then when I made the program I was like well logically I obviously <laughs> met you like way afterwards because that sounds yeah, awesome yeah. yeah it's um <clears throat> it yeah it was fun so and then level two so if you do level one um and then level two I get a little bit more advanced like the clean the snatch windmill sumo deadlift um a little more advanced Turkish get up and everything, but level one is really fun. And, and the way that I designed it was that, you know, it's a course, but you work out to learn the movements. You know what I mean? So that was one of the reasons we take like basically 10 weeks to get the swing because I love learning stuff and I love everything to be skill based. But I, I think for a lot of people, especially busy women, it's hard for them to just buckle down and learn. So if you can learn things in the context of a workout and really just keep patterning the movement, it can be a little bit more interesting. So they're just working right. out, but by the end, they have amazing kettlebell form. Yeah, that and that, that's, that's a tough one, the kettlebell swing. I think it's just like in the still mace world, everyone wants to do the 360, but it's like you got to learn the technique. That's the same thing in the kettlebell world, right, with your guys' swing. Yeah, 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 oh my gosh, it's so true. The 360 swing is really hard. And it's- <laughs> How are you doing with still mace? How is I'm- that going? It's, it's good. You're I have incredible to Incredible though. You, 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 th- you think, oh my gosh, I, I, I really like love it. And I think when I watch you do it, it just looks so effortless and pretty. And <laughs> I watch like Kel's Bells 88 do it. And of course, like she's, you know, so good. Um, Kel's Bell is like another story. Like I, like I had her in the, in the previous seasons and I'm just like, I still can't get over how good she is. It's yeah, incredible. she's so good. She's just, she's a, she's a force, man. Um, but I, I love the mace. It's so, the movement is so cool and it's so pretty and it feels really good. And, you know, we talked when you were on my podcast, I have to do a lot of work to even be able to do it correctly. So it's motivating to do like the mobility and the upper, you know, the thoracic and the shoulder mobility work you need to in order to be able to do it. 
And I'm sure it's interesting because you, you mostly work with pelvic. So that's kind of like lower body ish, right? Yeah. So do you, do you see the stillmates like working at all for something like that? Well, yeah, because everything that's happening, like you can't really access the pelvic floor as well as you should be if you don't have good alignment up top because you can't breathe well with the diaphragm. Um, so it is important. The thing I struggle with sometimes is finding the balance between too much tension and not tucking the tailbone too much because I'm trying to keep like a neutral pelvis. And so I think you have to find exactly, because if you don't tuck a little bit, you're going to hit your butt. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but if you tuck too much, people deal with like, I'm doing this for the YouTube people. I know the podcast people can see this, but you know, you, you get shortening of the muscles here and then you can deal with um, tailbone pain and constipation and pelvic floor dysfunction there. So trying to find that balance. Yeah. So for me, because I'm prone to over recruiting, creating tension, I have to do like primal movement, mobility stuff before I train with the mace and then afterwards just to keep the tension down. That is really cool. That, that's a really cool tip you just gave right now. Uh, I'm pretty sure anyone hearing this is going to be like, I've never heard that before. So that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Really yeah. appreciate it. It's all about managing that tension, man. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah. Cause in the still mace world, it's always about tucking, you know what I mean? To get that nice straight structure. So that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. And I, I just think it's the kind of thing that Everyone has to figure out what they want to do most. And I believe you can train to be able to do anything. But if you have public floor issues that exist now, then sometimes you have to take a step back from what you're doing and be like, can I rework this a little bit? And so if somebody is listening and they are doing steel maze stuff and they do have low back pain or tailbone pain the day after, um, you know, revisit how much tension you have. Maybe you do need to get on all fours and breathe and relax your belly to the floor and let go of your tension. Maybe you need to do some rocking to loosen up the tension in the sacrum before and after, because if you're tense and a little stress before you exercise, and it's not just stalemates, it's anything, you're just adding more stress and tension and inflammation to the body and exercise. So like, let's bring it down a notch, then train. And then if you have to take even breaks in your exercise to bring it down a little, to control the tension, um, you know, because some of us, we just run a little tense. I'm a type A personality. I'm a little like, ah, you know? <laughs> I'm pretty sure I am too. Like talking with you, I'm like, oh God, I'm probably one of those tense people. Yeah. But I mean, you have like, you know, if you pay attention to movement mechanics and stuff, like I think it's, it's when people get in these imbalance type postures and movement patterns that it becomes a real problem. It becomes more obvious, you know? So balancing tension is always important. And in fitness, we talk so much about the tension. But like you can only recruit as much as you relax. So I really love to talk about relax, inhale, inspire, breathe in, relax. Then you have all this power to recruit and to do stuff. But I think that a lot of people too, like, you know, you probably see it. People do in the mace where they don't really have the mechanics in place to be doing it. And they need mm -hmm. to kind of train that and get with somebody that can help them open up their show. I mean, I'm not even there yet. Like I'm still working on stuff. Yeah, no, I'm glad you mentioned it. And I think there's, again, you know, I think I mentioned this in your podcast, but there's always two worlds. There's the world where people just want to jump straight into mace. But like you said, they just don't have the mobility to be doing it in the first place. Um, or even the technique down. I mean, they just want to jump straight in there. And it's like, you need to work with a coach, go, go look for a coach first. And then, you know, and then look into other stuff like your programs, right? Just in case, just in case there's other stuff in there. Yeah, no, it's true. And it's like, I think it's this thing too, is like, why are you coming to Mace? Are you coming to Mace to have it teach you about yourself? Then you have to listen because it's going to show. And it's like that with any modality. But I feel like, you know, it's going to highlight things that you need to address. It's a grind. It's not a race, you know? So if it shows you something, then you better go work on it because otherwise your chickens will come to, to roost and nobody <laughs> wants to be like, you don't want to be like sharding, right? Or have like oh. <laughs> I love that word. I might put that in the description of this podcast. We talked to, about sharding. Yeah. I have to say, Julie Weeb PT, who's an incredible um, physical therapist, like she's the one that talks about it. And I feel like when I heard her talk about it, I'm like, yeah, this needs to be, this needs to be said more, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm glad we talked about all of this now. I don't want to take all of your day. I mean, I know we can sit here probably and talk about this shit all day. Yeah, no kidding. But, uh, okay, so... Where can people find you? Um, obviously, you're on Instagram, uh, you're on Facebook. Go ahead and, and give them all your information. 
Yeah, so I'm Sarah Smith Strength. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, same way. It's just at Sarah Smith Strength. And then my pod, my podcast, my, my website is sarahsmithstrength.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do have a podcast called Dirty Strength Radio. So, and there's an awesome, awesome episode featuring Steel Mace Warrior. <laughs> I was going to say, favorite. You, have a, you have a podcast. Let's talk about that. It's all cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so find me. I'm real responsive via DMs. And I love answering questions and talking about the public floor. So don't be shy. Right on. And, and honestly, I'm sold. I'm going to go check out your products right now and see what you got going. Uh, seriously, you, I'm pretty sure like just from talking to you in this podcast, I'm like, you have so much knowledge and I'm hopefully all the listeners um, get that same vibe and they go over there and hit you up with that stuff. Well, I'm so thankful. Um, thank you for saying that. I, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. <laughs> so well, you, well, you know more than, than, than me. I mean, obviously, and people out there, like I'm listening to you and you're like the total expert for sure. Mm, well, thank you so much. It's so nice. I love, I love your content. I love following you on social media. I'm so glad that we have connected and oh, yeah. if you, you sell the podcast to make some money so I can, and I'll come fly out to you. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Oh my God. Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much for being on here and saying yes. Uh, honestly, it was an honor to have you on, on here and uh, may the universe always flow with you. Thank you so much.